uh, spending our data. Um, so I took the learning outcomes from the previous um, group, but also refined a bit because it turned out to be short as well, um, shorter than I thought. Um, so this is about understanding why we need splitting the data. I think that's the one I mainly added. Also, it kind of overlaps with the second learning outcome, which is about trade-offs between um, too little training data and too much training data. Sorry, up. Um, and also I reordered them just because in terms of logics, it was working better for me. Because from this, you can go to the validation set of data, discuss it, and uh, slightly mentioned resampling, although it's not the topic of the chapter. I just have a slight a short word on this. <coughs> uh, that learning outcome, I just realized, I forgot. So we're not going to do explaining why data should be split unless someone wants to do it, because I completely neglected that. Um, explaining why it should be done on the independent experimental unit level. Never mind. Um, and then just so how to use our sample to split data, which is what I'm not managing to make work right now. Uh, but I've got the code. It worked two hours ago, so it is functional. It's something else. And um, I wrote some old code from BASA to show where it's different. It's not widely different, it's slightly shorter, so shorter is nicer. And um, discuss the stratified sampling needs, and then um, when you need to use the initial time split instead of initial split. OK, so why do we need to split data into training and testing? Um, that's mostly because of overfitting. So if you train your model on all your data, um, the model has seen all the data and it's perfectly fit to it. It's great, and it, except that when you bring on bring it on a, on fresh data, it just doesn't work because the model has learned to take into account even the noise in your training data, and it's developed a model which is probably too complex and um, not generally simple enough. And therefore, it's pretty useless, in fact. Um, I'll have to remember to share the RMD for last week and this week, but there's a, a blog I've put for reference here on this. Um, so this is the essential reason why you split it. And when that's going to be in the next three learning outcomes anyway. It's going to come back and forth. Um, if you have too little, too much test data, sorry, so the opposite. So if you have too little test data, overfitting, um, so that's why you need to split. You can't learn on only on all the data. If you Split it so that you have a lot of testing data. So maybe, I, I don't know what would be a lot. Um, I guess 50-50 or 60% testing data. Um, you have too much variance in your parameter estimates because the model is built on less data. And um, so your, your model is less reliable. On the other end, and that's why there's a trade-off if you have testing data, but too little, you have greater variance in the performance statistics. So it's not, it's not an easy case. Um, and it seems actually there is a lot of judgment because although there's a rule of some around where, you know, people say, well, you should speak 28, 20, 80, 20% uh, testing data, and um, that's also is in the chapter, in fact, it's not that clear cut. Um, so, the things to consider, for example, is how much parameters you have. If you have more parameters, you, know, you probably need a, a larger training set, while if you have less parameter, you probably could train on, on a smaller split on a more even split, I guess. Um, 
if you, what, what I found interesting when I was looking at this, because I was remembered that discussion, discussion from the previous chapter where they were trying to figure out what, where the 8020 was coming and I was trying to dig into it and I couldn't really find it. I had classes this week exactly on this and, um, you know, it's just, it's given to you and it's not really explained either. If you, um, so if you have too many parameters, many parameters, you should have a larger training set. But on the other hand, if you have, pardon my friend, uh, no, I'm not going to swear, uh, I've done that on camera today. If you, if you have a lot of data, like a lot, big data style, you know, hundreds, thousands, tens, thousands, that is probably not a worry anyway. And um, so the training set can be smaller. That's not a problem. And then uh, I found this reference, which I thought was really interesting, but that goes almost in chapter 10 already, because um, what they said is that if you have too small a sample, eventually you're going to need cross validation, so resampling, and um, therefore <laughs> it's almost irrelevant if you know how much training. Uh, how much how you're splitting your training and testing set. So it's again a lot of judgment. Um, it's you know statistics. After a few months, years, you learn that it's not so judgment and nothing else. Um, well, very little less. Um, because on top of this, you have this other layer, which is actually is. Also, it's often presented as a two-group split, where you have a training and a testing set. In fact, it's, it's more of a three-way. You have a training set and a validation set and a testing set. And so you need, your, learn, your model is learning on the training data. And then the performance of this learning is tested on the validation data, the validation set, sorry, and then, um, you go to the testing set. And so in fact, you have splitting, which could be 70, 15, 15 percent. Or, you know, 80, 10, 10, something like this. Um, so that goes back to, so you then, you know, the question of how you balance this is, is coming back. And I found um, one very interesting um, discussion on it, which, you know, highlights. So, not enough training data, it's not generalizable. We've discussed this. Uh, you know, you have, um, it's just, you can't learn enough, um, not enough validation data means that there's, um, when you decide which model is the best, you have more noise, is the most appropriate. I don't like using the word best. Um, you have more noise in these, these parameters you're using to decide the performance. So you're, uh, you risk making a optimal choice. And then not enough testing data is over, is a risk of overfitting. Um, so we're going back to, you know, there might not be ideal ratio. If people are really interested, there's a research paper I just found, um, but I haven't had time to look at, uh, looking at the ratio between training and validation. That brings me to, Anyway, it seems um, I have a bit of frustration. I must say, I didn't want to use the word frustration, but, um, but I find a bit frustrating that the chapter is actually not going into cross validation and validation, and it's going to it five chapters later because, um, and I don't want to jump guns because the way it's been presented so far and everything I've seen so far is that, you know, K-fold cross-validation is considered superior, uh, so probably superior is not a great word either, it's considered more appropriate. Um, and so I'm not, I don't know, I'm, I'm actually just curious, that's the way I want to say it, um, how we're going to approach everything looking at training and testing day sets while actually the validation is going to be left for five, five chapters in. Anyway, that aside, um, in terms of practically how you do that, um, in 
oui, c'est un hockey modèle. Um, ah, bah, really cool. to... oui, yeah, yeah. Um, so if you can go back top a little bit, can you scroll up? Yeah. Which one? Further? Um, up. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. So the number three, not enough validation data leads to more noise in the estimate. Um, uh, so can you explain further on this? Um, so when we don't have enough validation data, um, what really happens? Can you explain more of it? I'm not, uh, that's again where I'm going to have to have a bit of a wide guess, but it's um, like using what I know of cross K for cross validation, for example, where you're validating the model multiple times, and therefore you instead of having one set of performance statistics on the model, you have X times that set of performance statistics. So you can actually, um, it's like you have a distribution of the performance of the model instead of having an instance. And because you have a distribution, you have a better estimate and, and it's, it's, it's just like sampling in general. So when you sample, when, when you sample more participants, you have all more data. You have you know, less noise because the more and more uh, you have a refinement and you have a smaller standard deviation, so you get, um, that's where you get less noise. You have smaller standard deviation, smaller variance. And with validation, if you do more validation, you have the opportunity to have a sample of the model performance in a way. That's the way I understand it. I don't know if you yeah, so want to yeah, in the book, um, he said um, the validation data is mostly used in neural approaches. Um, uh, while statistics, they might consider, I'm not sure, the training data and test data. So I'm not sure about statistics. So does that mean um, in statistics, they don't actually use validation data often? Um, they use mostly um, training data and test data? Because he categorically said um, most. No, Canon, sorry. Uh, so in terms of my experience, uh, right now uh, we're learning data mining um, using Weka. Um, and so we're, we're using, I don't know, like the difference, <laughs> really, but it's what's the difference between statistics and, and using machine learning and, and using neural models? I'm not sure, but we're, we're running models with. The statistics with things which are would be considered statistics, you know, like simple uh, models like linear regressions, and we're doing cross validation and validation. Just to quickly so sure. mention on that, sorry, yeah. um, there is no difference between modeling and statistics. Um, it yeah. just the AI or um, machine learning or deep learning is just a way of applying statistics. Um, yeah. It's really that it's that simple. As for the cross-validation and complexity of it, part of the reason why you want an 80-20 split is historical. Um, people did that historically because it's easier with smaller data sets. With larger and larger data sets, it's much easier to do uh, k-fold cross-validation instead and split them up into large sets. But there's also the fact of uh, the amount of processing that you have to do. So um, if you've got just an 80-20 split, you've got a lot less um, comparisons to do. When you have, um, say, something like tenfold cross-validation. There's a bit more processing to do and it takes a bit more time. So part of it comes down to judgment about, as you were saying about the size of the data set, you know, it's a really important thing to talk about because if your uh, data set is absolutely massive, you probably don't need to run loads of models straight away. Sometimes you're just trying to build an initial model. So it really depends on what your needs are and what data set you're dealing with. And I think you're quite right in, when you're saying, it is a bit of a judgment call. Yeah, I think I, I I was going to write this in my notes and I forgot, but that point you made on computational power at well, August is really important. Like you have big data and even the split, you know, like if you're going to train on 80% of, you know, thousands of data points, it's going to be so computationally heavy that you probably should go for a, a split which is uh, with less training data and and then you know 
uh, but also you could use validation more, but, um, oh, probably you shouldn't actually, sorry. Um, so I agree, yeah, totally down to judgment. Um, I didn't see the bits about the neural bit, I, I didn't pick it up, I felt sorry if I didn't pick it up on validation, uh, but like I said, we are, we are currently do, running some cross validation on models which would be more traditional and not neural, which are, you know, logistic and, and linear regressions. So I don't yeah. think there is a rule on this. So uh, on top of um, what August, sorry if I pronounce that incorrect, <laughs> incorrect. Um, uh, you made mention, um, so if we have a massive amount of data, yes, of course, we are not going to do the modeling straightforward on the data. We may use the model, we may start with the modeling on subset of the data. So when we subset the data um, uh, and the, that subset will generalize on the large amount of data that we have, if we do the modeling and uh, we finish everything, does that mean uh, the result, the generalization of that small data will also apply to the large amount of data? So what do you mean? You'd have a small training and a bigger validation set, is that what you mean? And then a... No. Um, Sorry. So um, what I mean is um, if we have massive amount of data, um, I think August made mention, um, you may not straight away do modeling on that massive amount of data. You can subset the data, do some modeling with it. And uh, if you find the right parameters and stuff like that, then you can do the final model on the large amount of data. Is that right? I don't know if I missed the point what August was saying. I think what you're describing is uh, the training testing approach. In any case, you always, I mean, even more so if you have a large amount of data, but you, the, the approach, the training testing idea is here because you don't want overfitting. So even with a smaller amount, you tend to, you know, do uh, training on a smaller, on a subset and then validate, not validate, but test on, a, on a, another subset, which is fresh and has not been seen. You also need, um, sorry, Ken, you also need more, um, more information to build a model than you do to test a model. So that's why you also will want a larger training set than a test set. Uh, but yes, you're, that's also correct. Anything else? Um, okay, so in terms of code, I mean, it's really quite simple. Um, so I'm just going to make that a bit bigger. Um, so using tidy model, you can um, do simple split using um, initial split, where you just tell it which data you want to, you want to split and uh, which proportion, so that's proportion of your training set you need to enter. And you save that um, into a data frame, which, um, or table, I can't remember which one, but data frame in case, um, and then you use it to assign to a train to, to separate and have now to, so you basically you end up with your data and you end up with the data frame which has information about how to split and then you have your training data and then your testing data. It's about four line, um, you set a random seed for reproducibility purposes at the beginning. So then when you do it again, it's always um, the same split. And uh, how you would do it before, uh, how I was taught to do it a few months ago with base R is um, like this. So there's a couple of differences, which is one uh, for the test data, you need to remember to uh, put a minus, um, so you might forget, um, and it's just, you know, um, <laughs> less tidy on the, on the I, it's just neatly, especially when you're used to tidy stuff. And you have to specify which variable is your outcome actually when you do the split. So um, it's tidy, tad more. It, it doesn't 
improve it massively, but it's hopefully everyone is convinced it's just tidier on the eye. Um, as an aside, I've rediscovered today that data aims as in tidy model um, is not snake case and it's just driving me crazy, but um, that's my other thing. And I was trying to make it clean with janitor, it just wouldn't do it. Uh, which is why I'm, I'm not fine with aims from tidy model right now. Um, so this is basic training and splitting, um, but then sometimes you need to do it in a stratified way. Um, and I, I'm going to argue for probably a lot of time, in fact, and I have questions about this. I don't know if you would, you would agree with me. So when you try to predict the class in particular, so category, um, classes can be very in, in balance. So case, cases I would think about are in the medical field, in, in the clinical field. So, you know, um, if you look, if you try to predict depression or disease in general, the population has a smaller proportion of cases positive cases, thankfully. And um, so you have this very imbalance, um, imbalance of classes, which means when you're going to do your split randomly, you run the risk of having um, class proportions which are very widely different from the actual population class proportions. So maybe you'll have very few disease cases in your testing data, and, and then your testing is not really going to work, or vice versa in your training data. So what you should do then is stratify sample using the strata argument. And um, it's, that is pretty neat and simple because you just need to tell um, R here using strata, what is your outcome? So sales price, and then you can pick up the proportions of classes and uh, stratify so that those proportions are reflected in the training and the testing set. Um, so that's uh, neat. My question was, I sort of hinted on this already, but I have a feeling actually, my, my question was like, why don't we just do stratify something all the time um, when we do training and splitting? Because I'm not sure in real data there is ever a case where, you know, you don't have those imbalance. Um, I have an opinion that maybe because we're, we're all very often trained on machine learning on and, and modeling on iris, and iris is perfectly balanced in classes. Uh, maybe that's why, but genuinely, I don't think real data is ever very balanced. I don't know what people think. Unless you're, yeah, I guess if you're trying to predict gender from a model, like, you know, gender description, like words which describe gender, something like this, but anyone? Uh, maybe I can say something. So I actually yeah. think of this the opposite way. Uh, we're oh. in, yeah, because usually when, yeah, here you have this example for a uh, medical case we're in, a rare disease is rare. So let's say only 2% of the population gets the disease and 98% mm -hmm. of the population don't get the disease. If you don't stratify what you'll get, assuming that you're doing a random sample, your sample should approximate that proportion. You'll get 2% of people with disease and 98% of people with no disease, right? That is the expectation when you do sampling. The problem there yeah. is that if you're optimizing your model for, let's say, accuracy, then the model could just say everyone has the disease, right? Because it will say 98% of the time I'm correct and I'm okay being wrong 2% of the time because only 2% of, of the population has the disease. But for medical research, I don't think that is um, what they're trying to, um, what they call this, to optimize for. What they want is they want to know what features would predict the disease. So it's better mm -hmm. for the model to have higher false positives than false negatives, or did I have it the wrong way? Whatever it's, it's optimizing for, for for it's, it's it's optimal to screen for more people that they are likely to have the disease than to miss the disease, right? So yeah. when you're stra stratifying, uh, I would tend to think that 
you would oversample the people with disease, right? So you're going to mm. say strata with 20% of disease, 80% no disease. That way, when you're training it, your model is able to capture the population that is highly imbalanced or like the small portion of the population. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe I learned this the wrong So you're suggesting that you, you would set it up so that it overestimates the proportion of people with a disease? Yeah, you're, you're, you're going to strata it such that you um, increase or you essentially boost the people with um, that, that are imbalanced. Uh, if I can add to that. Um, so my understanding is that, uh, you know, uh, the things that you're saying right now, those are taken care by uh, functions such as SMOT or negative resampling that is, you know, later down the line. Uh, the reason why would why we would like to have that strata right here in the initial split is, let's say we have a, a small data set, like let's say 100, 100 rows, and uh, uh, we have a class imbalance again, um, let's say 2% uh, of uh, the people have a condition and the rest do not have a condition. Uh, when you do random sampling there, you know, the chances of picking up uh, those 2% that in 100 rows would be just two people, you know, that chances of picking those two people would be very low. Like it could be that, uh, you know, you when you do a random sampling, uh, the random sample doesn't contain at all those two specific cases. Yeah. So for, for smaller uh, data sets, having this uh, strata makes sense. You know, mm -hmm. like when you have, let's say a million rows, uh, you know, 2% would still, uh, would be like some, uh, what, 20,000, I guess. Yeah, so you know, chances of picking those twenty thousand people would be fairly high, but for smaller data set, it could be that you know the sampling just leaves out the uh, positive cases as such. So it makes sense to have the straight uh, strata when um, you know the number of rows is less, so that we can kind of enforce the data, uh, the sampling method to pick up the positive cases. Does that make sense? Yes. No, actually, I think it's a really good point. Yes, uh, if you have a lot of uh, really big data, you probably don't need to care too much about this. And uh, Luis made me think of something which is probably also further down the line, which is um, that's also where, where, you know, judgment and domain expertise comes against, like if you're estimating a model for rare disease and stuff like this, that's why you should look more. Your estimates of the performance are different, like, what matters, you know, so it's, it's going to be, yes, the, the false negative, I think, because you don't want to miss on people who are actually sick and, and not detect them. Um, but that's further down the line in performance assessment, I think. So, okay, maybe, yes, not use stratified something for the time. I will retire my point. Yeah, um, I think, can I add some? Yeah, yeah. I think just tying the two together, it really depends on the domain and what the research question is. So if it's like identifying the illness, like if it's being used as a diagnostic tool, then you're going to want the proportion of uh disease cases in the data set to be roughly equivalent to the prevalence in the population. But if you're going for identifying indicators that predict disease that might be like precursors to disease or disease markers, uh, so you can identify people that are at risk, then you are probably going to want more people from the disease data set in there. So you get a better read on what actually are the disease markers. So I think it just depends on the research question going into the modeling as to like how to stratify. But in general, I feel like you can't go wrong with stratification. It's more so how. Okay. Um, I also just wanted to make a comment um, about the a scenario where you would have balanced data and it 
it kind of has to do with if you define your your parameter according to the population and um there's in my field there's a couple of um good examples of this we um so i work in like in um in taste responsiveness and some of the some of the parameters for example if we if we look at the way in which people respond to bitterness the way the classification of people is defined by splitting a third of the population in one class a third of the population in another class and a third of the population in in the last class and so so by definition your data is essentially balanced yeah no yeah. but I, I, probably, I probably did overstate um, <laughs> i'm full of overstatement and uh, and strong opinions in general so, so, so am I. <laughs> um yeah and it's probably yeah sorry uh i was just going to say it's, it's probably also because of my field and coming from psychology i can think more of you know cases where it's unbalanced so i think that was uh some should no? yeah um my question is um using strata and without uh without strata is are both random sampling right um, yes, it's randomized, stratified. It's stratified, randomized, whichever is the order. It's uh, it's randomized, but making sure that there isn't even a, a split. Yeah, but in the training, the data. Sorry. Uh, uh, so? Just the question is: if we use strata, the sampling is random, right? It's random sampling. It's still random, but stratified before. So I assume you. Uh, I would assume um, what goes behind is you take, you know, um, the twenty percent of the class A, and then randomly assign them. I'm not sure. Genuinely, at uh, five nights, my day has been too long. But I fairly, I'm just going to take a strong bet. It's it's randomized. But stratified. It's randomized just so that you know it ends up with two percent of disease in testing and two percent of disease in training, for example. Yeah. yeah. So I'm. Go ahead. I'm thinking it's randomized because both of them they are from this um, function, random uh, initial split, which are from um, yeah. rand uh, R sample, which is randomized. Yeah. And um, the only difference is that this one, when we use strata we um, stratify the data and take this some random sampling from each strata. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You expressed it way better than me right now. Yes, you take a random sample, a sample from each strata. Exactly. Yeah, we Thanks. probably worth mentioning here too that both create data partition and the uh, initial split do mm -hmm. Well, uh, create data partition automatically stratifies your data. It, it doesn't, there's no like, you don't have to specify it. It just automatically stratifies based on whatever your class is that you are predicting. If you include that predictor class in there. Um, and then that strata argument allows you to stratify by a um, stratification. And then if you use the sample, in VASAR, which was kind of like built for random sampling. Uh, as far as I know, you have to do the sampling manually. Uh, like you'd have to split your data set up and sample from each of them in the quantities that you need. So that's important to note that like if you do it purely randomly, it's not going to be stratified, but some of these functions kind of do it for you. So it's good to know like what's happening under the hood with the mm -hmm. function that you're using. Yeah. Thanks. Um, also, there was a note um, that you can only stratify on one dimension. So, if for some reason you, you had needs to stratify on, on several parameters because of 
I, I can't think of a case, but I'm sure there's some. Um, you can't really do that with strata, the strata argument. Um, the final point in the, the final function in the chapter is uh, that um, if you, in point slash function, if you work with a time series, um, you should, the, the splitting is not the same because what should go into your test set should be the most recent data. Um, and um, therefore, um, instead you need to use the function in initial time split, um, which I, I didn't try to code because I genuinely don't have enough any um, time series under my hand and I, I didn't have time to search for any. Um, you need to sort the data appropriately beforehand, which is kind of a, a bummer, if you ask me, a bit. Uh, that it doesn't do it. Uh, I don't know. It's um, I'll have to dig into it to be honest. Um, why not? But I had some questions which I didn't write. But um, I traced questions and I couldn't find an answer, so that's why I didn't write them. So I was wondering. Um, that probably means also that if you have repeated measures, which in my field is a uh, is very often the case, uh, and Repeating measures not being necessarily time series, but you have the same participant doing two conditions and, and they're just, obviously they're in the, at different times, but they're also, well, they're not even necessarily at different times because I could, uh, I don't know, it's, uh, maybe I'm thinking too much experimentally and it was too confused, so I'm just going to leave it um, for now because I, I need to think about it um, unless someone has an opinion about repeating measures and um, and machine learning and, and modeling in general. Um, I just don't know if it applies fully beyond time series. <laughs> yes, when I have my questions more formulated, Janita, I will definitely. <laughs> um, the, I know there's stuff, stuff on modeling repeated measure, but I, funny enough, I have never really looked into it uh, because in psychology, when we do repeated experiments, we just do ANOVA and quit and it's not modeling. Um, and, and that's it. So I'm left here with my misunderstandings or lack of. Anyone wanted to add some things on this? on the chapter in general, I mean. Oh, thanks, Luis. I think the um, time series stuff is really well covered by uh, Rob Heidman's book, um, which is the um, forecasting principles and practice. Uh, basically in the chapter that he does on, um, uh, chapter three, I can't remember, what was it, what was it on? Uh, basically, he basically lists this section on uh, training test sets, and at the beginning of the page, uh, there's a bit about um, the training set. And so, whenever we build models um, in my company, what we do is we uh, basically build the model on the old data and use that to create the new data. But when you're doing it on more sophisticated, so when you're when you're trying to build a model from scratch, as opposed to just training a new set. And you need to do a bit more, um, a bit more comparisons between different models. For instance, you'll want to do um, cross validation. And so, when you go down to the page, you can see the time series cross validation. You can see how it splits it across several different um, different time points where it gets um, later and later and later. But it just basically picks up the different. Um, it builds a model on the different lengths, and uses that to predict the. the um, use that to predict the most recent results. Now, one of the reasons why it does that is because if you use the whole data set, you can have data in there that is not useful. So quite often, one of the things we find most useful with time series is actually to remove information from the models because too much information can actually make the model too, um, can make the model, well, it's kind of overfit, isn't it? It makes the model too stringent and not flexible enough to uh, to reality. 
So um, there, there's lots of different ways to do this kind of thing, but basically you just taking older data and you're choosing when to cut, cut off the older data in order to work out which one's going to build the best model out the different versions in order to predict newer data that comes in the next level sequence. And as you can see a bit further down, it then splits it with, you could do it several steps in advance and have a gap in between. Um, but yeah, uh, I mean, it's really good to learn about. And I think that this is a book that I've spoken to Stephen about before, which we'd probably like to look into. Um, but it's something that is missing from this particular book. Yeah, and there's a, I believe there's a model time, what's it called, model time? The, um, that's a tidy models extension for time series um, that I've used a couple times and that's really awesome. Um, and it makes it really easy to do what August was saying with time series cross-validation and you can just kind of stack or compare like five different models and, mm -hmm. you know, put it in one list and it, you're able to just kind of run it and it takes care of a lot of the behind the scenes stuff for you. It's really nice. Um, yeah. And I think August, you mentioned before in Slack that this one, this book is, uh, there's a recent new version, right? That's uh, like a tidy uh, take, like a tidy version of a lot of his old stuff. Uh, really, that's a really good point. I completely forgot about that. Uh, yeah, so they've, um, they used to use forecast, uh, which was the old package for doing this kind of thing. So that's, uh, I suppose, historically, like the fact that um, Carrot is a predecessor to tidy models to some extent. Um, well, Parsnip's really the predecessor. Uh, sorry, the, the new one. Um, but forecast uh, was the original package that was used. And actually, um, was it was one you talk about there, Kevin? Um, Model time, I think. Yeah, model, model. time by Matt uh, Dato. Yeah, yeah, that's him. Yeah, of yeah, a, a, a business science. Um, his courses are amazing, by the way. <laughs> I actually signed up the other day. Incredible stuff. Um, but um, basically, I've forgotten what I was talking about. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I've got, I've, I've lost. Sorry. <laughs> the Heinemann um, tidy, tidy version of his book. Uh, oh, the God. version three, I think. Yeah. Did I take that long to say that? Yeah, they've they've updated. So they've got this package now called Fable, and I suppose it's like the time series equivalent of um, it's like the time series equivalent of uh, tidy models, I suppose in a way. It link model time links into though um, into tidy models a lot better than Fable currently does. And there, therein lies the problem with Fable. It's still not quite um, as good for doing lots of models and for linking in with uh, the Tidyverse to some extent. They're still working on it, but the problem is they're almost competing. Um, it'd be better if they just pulled it all together, but like, you know. Uh, but having said that, this book is great. And uh, I do think it's something to learn. I think part of the difficulty for me to think about time series is just that it's coming from experimental research. It, you know, it just doesn't apply and I get my head, I, I don't even need it, so I can't even think about how to use it right now because I can't see how to, what to make of it and why I would use it. It's just a regression. <laughs> <laughs> Think of it as a regression. It's like a regression. The, the x axis, axis is time, y axis is well, y z, and you know, you know, all the other ones that are hidden behind the different dimensions. They're all the other factors. Experimental psychology is exactly a, a tradition of forecasting. You know. If you think about if you think about when we do a linear model, we're just throwing a line through a series of data points. Mm -hmm. Essentially, we're doing yeah. the same with time series, but the difference is that time has aspects to it because of things like seasonality and daily events or things like what happens at night and what happens at day. And so you've got lots of repetitions and patterns, and that basically messes around with the variance and how we can predict it. So what we do is detrend that by removing those seasonal components, um, well, and the yeah. other components. So uh, detrending is really important. Uh, so get rid of the trend, get rid of the seasonality, and then you're left with the residuals because the residuals are what's going to tell are basically what's going to tell you about um, 
changes or uh, different bits of information about how a model is working. And that's what you need to analyze in order to get better performance out of the time series, really. So you predict on that. Okay, good. I, I, I found a good data set to try and, and learn something. I need to find a data set that interests me. Need to, do, you know, something psych but longitudinal. That's what I need to find. You could probably look at different kinds of mood disorders, people reaching out for different kinds of mood disorders based on mm -hmm. cycles of the moon and cycles of the seasons. I bet there's seasonal trends with that for sure. And mood, like trends based on the moon cycles as well. There's also the other thing like, um, you know, EEG. EEG is essentially time series. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, you're just pulling out um, changes, event-related potentials quite often. But again, you have to put, get rid of the noise. It's essentially detrending, isn't it? Um, mm. Kevin, any thoughts on that? Because you do a lot of the uh, time series as well, don't you? Oh, I was just going to say, I was trying to find a, sorry, background noise. I was trying to find, uh, there's a really nice, physio, it's called PhysioNet, I think. Uh, PhysioNet, uh, hold on, let me find it. I'll share the link. Where you can, um, there's a ton of open data for physiological uh, t uh, uh, data sets. Uh, uh, that have been published. Um, so if you're looking to have practice, that's a really good place to go to. Yeah, cool. Anyone knows of a, something that really interests me to play is a, maybe a sports one, because I think you could do some time series with sports. That's what I need to find. I'm just going to go and look at rowing. Data sets. Fairly sure I already looked and this isn't enough to my taste. Um, ooh, wait. Okay, anyone else on anything? Actually, there's something else that I think is worth pointing out um, because uh, Kevin mentioned the model time. Um, so, um, the guys at um, uh, Business Science also created this um, this uh, incredible package called Anomalizer, um, and it's oh, it, it just makes my life so much better. <laughs> uh, I'm sure Kevin knows what I'm talking about, but like when you're doing you're dealing with time series, there are so many instances of just spikes in data, whether that be whether you're dealing with e-commerce data or banking data or something like that, there are always odd spikes here or there which just skew the forecast and you have to remove them because if you want to do some modeling that's kind of um, like to create new features or to create better, uh, better forecasts in the future, you, you have to remove those uh, or at least flag to the system what is an anomaly. And if you are doing time series, you can't really do without it. It was originally developed by um, Twitter, and then the model, then the business science people basically created a version of it. And actually, I think I'll probably uh, mention it tomorrow in the advanced R class because they actually use um, uh, uh, they use tidy eval in order to make it. It's pretty. It's really. It's a really cool bit of uh, software actually that uses tidy principles. Um, and it's just nice to look at, actually. I'll send off a brilliant. Uh, yeah, I've used it a couple of times. It's really, it's really nice uh, interface. Um, I found when I used it, it had a lot of trouble with weekends for some reason. Maybe I wasn't setting up the seasonality correctly, but uh, it was saying like everything on a weekend was an anomaly, um, which I, which was not not great for what I was trying to do, but. Um, kind of yeah. is when you think about it well but not if it occurs every week you know like <laughs> yeah, sure. um but but yeah uh yeah a lot of our work too uh, my job is uh kind of is around anomalies so we we make a lot of models and then look at like the difference between uh predicted and observed and use that not to clean it but to uh identify problematic cases that we need to pay more attention to um so that that happens a lot and uh, but yeah i've used uh anomalize a couple times for, for that process but 
Yeah, and um, if you guys want, uh, so Matt Danko, I think he's the one who created Model Time. Uh, he has really good webinars, I guess, each Wednesday at one. Uh, you can search the businessscience.io uh, website. Uh, he generally walks through one of the like, you know, applications of uh, model time or any new thing that he's working on. So those are really good. Oh, there is also one more thing to say on this. Um, the whole idea of uh, k-fold cross-validation really is extremely well covered in introduction to statistical learning and if you haven't read that book um, I highly recommend it the authors bring out a new book in summer um, but it's an incredibly well written book that basically explains these uh, these principles and to be honest is you know you can't read that book enough um, it's just got so much wisdom in there but it really helps you to understand why statistically these are the best practices when you're trying to build predictive models and also to be honest why they're also good practice for if you're trying to build a good inferential models as well Okay, it's three, it's three to whatever time in your time zone. You want to quote it? Who is doing next week? I'm not sure. Uh, August is doing next week, right? I am. Um, it's quite a large chapter. We might have to split that up. Um, as I'm looking at it, it's about six times longer than any chapter that we've gone over so far um i mean i i've got a presentation on monday but um i can go over it and is uh it's feet is it it's feature engineering um which is quite a large and complex subject and i'm not sure we can do it all in one hour but you know i'll certainly attempt to um but um let me know what you guys think if you're able to have time to read it all and also you know, as I read it across the week, I'll see if I can fit it all into one, um, into one presentation, because I'm not sure convinced um, that you can give feature engineering enough time in just one hour session. But you know, it's up to you. Yeah, I mean, I think we can probably spread it out. Like, I just get the feeling that like these first three chap few chapters are like fluff compared to what the last chapters are going to be like it's just going to get really dense from here on yeah i agree should be split mm -hmm. that's fine cool um yeah i'm on the spreadsheet so i can change that George. yeah go for it i'll do it for one week at a time so how should we split it should we do 80 20 or oh, i'm sorry right I, that's that's my cue to exit i think <laughs> nice to see you all see you Likewise. <laughs> Bye.